This may sound strange But it's good for your brain Yeah, live from Las Vegas over TalkRadio1.com. Mark Germain for the 21st day of April 2020. Have an interesting one for you this evening. Since we want to try and give the uh, corona, uh, coronavirus a respite for the night, um, you've heard Justin Levine on this show many times in the past, our lawyer, magician, friend of the show. And one of his uh, avocations is uh, defending Woody Allen. And if you uh, don't know, Woody Allen had a very controversial memoir recently uh, released. Apropos of Nothing is the title. And uh, also to talk about the book and about the controversy about the publishing of the book is a, a friend of Woody Allen, Steve Stolier, who's a television writer, actor, voiceover artist, with a lengthy IMDb profile that you can read for yourself. He is also a guy who has a long history with the Groucho Marx. He lived with Groucho for a while, wrote a book about Groucho Marx that uh, is or is not going to be a major motion picture sometime soon, Steve. Uh, um, let me see. I have to answer carefully because your co-host is an attorney. Let's <laughs> right. say it is going to be a motion picture, but not necessarily a major motion picture. Okay. All right. So that does that mean it would be on like Netflix or a service? Well, like that, no. Or? I just uh, it's just that I have uh, uh, I wouldn't want to tout something as a major. And and it, here we are now back to the coronavirus. Things were moving along very smoothly. Yeah. And now we have something called force majeure, which oh. my old friend Bill Dial would call a force manure. <laughs> uh, which puts everything on hold because, of course, no one is making movies now. Right. But, uh, you know, it has been optioned, and I co-wrote the screenplay, and it's going to be very strange to see someone playing me at 20 years old on the screen. Is that it's how old about, you were when you when you met Groucho Marx? You were 20? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. I was just, I was a student at UCLA, and uh, I helped get Animal Crackers re-released and was rewarded with this astonishing dream come true job of working for Groucho in his house the last three years of his life as his secretary and archivist. And, uh, and I was, yeah, I was a huge Marx Brothers fan. So it was a, it was a literal dream come true because I used to dream about meeting him and then I'd wake up and as the image was dissipating, I'd think, damn it, it was only a dream. (laughs) So yes. And, and my work for Groucho led to my friendship with Dick Cavett, which in turn led to meeting Woody Allen. So it's all uh, contagious. Uh, I assume both of you have read the book. I yes. Have. Yes. I have. And did you did you read the book before it was released? No, but I did receive a complimentary copy from the author. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Was it yeah. auto- was it autographed? No, it was sent directly from the publisher. And uh, so it has yet to be signed, but uh, but that's okay. I was happy to have it before most people, and I kept giving them a running uh, narration on Facebook about, well, Amazon now says April eighteenth. Well, now they're saying they don't know when they'll have it in. Well, now I hear there's going to be an audio book. I didn't think there was going to be, but Woody did it, and uh, and we don't know when it'll be out. And there's a Kindle, and that's available now. But if you want a book book, that's not going to be till the end of April. And uh, anyway, now all three floor mats are available. <laughs> so let's <laughs> talk about the book. Uh, yes, and. and- uh, and before we talk about the book, let's talk about the controversy, which was that Hachette Publishing, uh, who also published uh, Woody Allen's son's book, uh, Ronan Farrow's book. Uh, uh, Ronan Farrow has been an outspoken 
what's the opposite of advocate? He's been an antagonist toward his father, Woody Allen, yeah. and didn't want the book to be released under the same um, uh, the same publishing company. Several employees at Hachette um, said that if the book is published, they will quit, and they they left, I guess, for the day. And the publisher blinked, which I've never heard of, especially considering uh, the whole idea of publishing is to sometimes do uh, controversial works. And also, well, I can underst- I can understand wanting to protect the sales, or you know, not ruffle feathers or something. What doesn't make sense to me is they knew when they agreed to publish it that they were going to walk into a buzzsaw of pushback from all, from the whole, uh, times up me to, uh, Woody is a sexual predator gang that have been shooting down anything remotely resembling a positive story about him in the media. So when they agreed to publish it, they had to have known there was going to be big time pushback. Um, I don't know whether it was because, Ronan, Ronan's book was published by the same company, which calls into question the wisdom of their agreeing to do it initially. But I was pretty crestfallen when they caved because it's one of those things where I feel like, well, the terrorists have won. The, the self-righteous and offended employees walked out rather than having their name associated with a horrible, horrible thing like Woody Allen's memoir and then they caved instead of instead of uh, fi- firing them. Um, but luckily, another uh, uh, publisher with a more pronounced spinal column picked it up, and now it is available for all to read. And uh, uh, I think it's really wonderful. It's a, such a blend of, you know, the early. His early years almost seemed like the narration for radio days. And I think he's very hard on himself in his marriages and in his talents. And uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. I mean, completely separate from the whole Mia Farrow, Dylan, uh, Ronan thing. It's just a, a fabulous document of his take on his life and career. And he's always been his his most severe critic, um, I, you may know that uh, he disliked Manhattan when he completed it and made an offer to United Artists that he would direct a film for them for nothing if they would shelve Manhattan. And uh, to, lucky for us, they didn't take him up on it. And I think it's imprecise what the, his real hassle was with it, but I think. It was something like he looked at it and thought, if this is the best I can do at this point in my career, maybe I'm in the wrong business. Um, anyway, he is he's tough on himself. And then I think eminently fair when it gets into all the Mia Farrow stuff. He has no problem lauding the wonderful work she did in his films, which is kind of indisputable. He brought things out in her talent that no one before or since has been able to do. But again, I hasten to add, if he were guilty, that's, that's not a mitigating factor. I, I don't, I'm not big on letting uh, sexual predators off the hook just because they do good work. Th- those are separate tracks. Uh, but in this case, since he is really the victim of Mia's, as Dick call, Cavett called it, pathological vengeance um, over the whole Sun Yi thing, uh, you don't really need to, to, to say, well, he, he, he's done good work, so, so let's not judge him uh, on his personal life. You can judge him on his personal life, because while he's not perfect, uh, there are no uh, uh, felonies here. There are, are at no. best misdemeanors without crimes. It, it, it was it was it was that question that originally prompted me to really study the case in depth because I've always been a, a fan of his films. And when society started to try and more or less guilt trip me on liking his films, I I asked myself the threshold questions like, well, 
is he guilty, first and foremost? Because if he's not guilty, I don't have to wrestle with these questions. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really started digging into all this huge mountain of reporting and evidence that that came about in the early 1990s that society right. simply forgot about and that that the press is either too lazy or or even worse uh, for their own ideological purposes simply does not want to regurgitate well it for for at least a generation or more it isn't regurgitation it's news to them because because of the the whole Me Too thing and Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby and things like that, uh, you know, we're in this era where, I mean, um, you know, the, the, the walking the plank of Al Franken uh, is another good example. Um, I, I'm, everybody is so quick to uh, trip the guillotine lever that uh, they don't bother looking beneath the surface, but well, yes, but it, it was all it was all dealt with in the early '90s, and two sets of child abuse experts, who Mia insisted be the ones that examined the daughter, concluded that no abuse had occurred except for having been heavily coached by Mia yep. about what the alleged story was, and so now and now that Dylan has grown up a bit. She's old enough to give a teary-eyed interview where she talks about the horrible thing that happened. But sadly, Dylan is also a victim because she had been systematically brainwashed from a very early age to hate Woody and coached on what the narrative is and all the details of the supposed molestation. And so... I I think if you hooked her up to a lie detector test, she probably would pass it, which doesn't mean that Woody did it. It just shows that Mia was willing to sacrifice her daughter in order to get back at him uh, for having latched on to Soon Yi. She said to him, uh, you took my daughter, I'm going to take yours. And, and she said, I'm going to do something tomorrow uh, I'm going to really get you. And he said, what are you going to do? Shoot me? And she said, no, this is worse. And lo and behold, the next day was when the whole story about Woody molested his daughter and uh, is a monster and blah, blah, blah. Steve, you, you mentioned uh, Cosby and Weinstein in the same sentence as Woody Allen. And there are hundreds of accusers of Cosby and Weinstein. There is really only one accuser of Woody Allen and that's Dylan Farrow, um, who well, right? Yeah, and and Ronan and Mia. No, Ronan doesn't claim that he was abused by Woody Allen, does no, he? No, no, no. But Ronan Ronan claims Woody abused Dylan. So there's three people saying he did this, but it is only the Dylan incident in his life that has, you know, that I mean, the, he he. He has dated younger women, not underage women, and there's just a chasm of difference between an older man being attracted to younger women and taking a, a six-year-old girl up to an attic and... Uh, in the middle and, of, the day, of the day, in a yes. house full of people, despite yes. the fact that he had you know, access to her as his daughter multiple times alone. And, yes. And, but, but somehow, yeah, this was the one time. In, in the book, uh, one of the New York Times uh, book reviewers said, nearly every time a woman is mentioned in Woody Allen's memoir, apropos of nothing, there's a gratuitous pronouncement on her looks. Uh, he talks about delectable bohemian little kumquats in New York City. When he was filming Casino Royale, the James Bond spoof, he writes, one could stroll along the King's Road and pick up the most adorable birds in their miniskirts. Um, he does have a weird view of women. I mean, even the, he, his own writing is odd. That doesn't mean he's a child molester. It doesn't mean that there's that there's uh, smoke where there there's fire where there's smoke. You, you, right. you make me feel guilty, Mark, because it's like I feel I have this exact same view when I when I'm walking down the boulevard and I see an attractive woman. It's like oh. 
That's a nice looking girl. The and difference nice is that oh. the difference is Woody doesn't feel an obligation to be um, diplomatic when yeah. he gives public statements. And th- this has gotten me into arguments with good friends of mine who are pro Woody and anti Mia and all that. And they keep saying things like, if he just wouldn't say it like that, or if he'd only come out and clarify this, and it's like you're projecting how you would behave. He doesn't, he's not going to censor himself for fear of what he refers to in the book as the appropriate police. He's being honest. And if, you know, I, I'm 65 now, and it doesn't mean that I am more attracted to women in their mid 60s than I would be to whoever like the current Playboy centerfold would be. Exactly. You're dealing with <laughs> biology and evolution and a lot of stuff that's more than just it's frowned upon in polite society. So the fact that he, you know, the other thing that that people forget about. Oh, wait, wait, one, keep, wait, one they, sec- wait one second, Steve. If people think you're a creep and it specifically you're a creep with young women. Maybe maybe be mindful of that and not refer to women as birds and not refer to uh No, he's he's not going to edit himself because of how this might come off. That's the difference. And he pays a price for it, but it is he's being uh honest and upfront instead of uh thinking yeah. and also and people, it's like with Manhattan People, you know, the the anti-Woody people say, well, there, there, you see, that's the real him. And the flip side of that is he has written so many compassionate, understanding, sympathetic, three-dimensional female roles in his films um, that often lead to nominations and Oscars for the women in his films um, they often show a just really remarkable insight into, you know, you think about something like another woman, you know, women getting into middle age and, and having questions about their attractiveness and the, you know, I mean, the, he has written some of the greatest female roles and not just as, you know, ditzes or as straight people to play off of, but, you know, often their superior uh, to him, to his characters in the films, and I think he he loves women, but not just not as sexual objects, but he really loves them. So, Steve, yes, I know, I know, gonna- I, I know you um, uh, have a relationship with Woody Allen, and obviously that figures into your understanding of the the story about the molestation. Did you know? And I know, Justin, you want to get in here, but did you know Woody Allen before the accusations of molestation? Yes. You did. Okay. And so when you first heard this story about you know, the accusation and the investigation by the district attorneys and the, all that went on, did you think this is possible or did you think this is not possible? Well, here is where I feel compelled to interject a personal note, and that is that my late wife, Angelique, had been horrifically sexually abused as a child and adolescent for years by her brother and her father. And I had a front row seat to the devastation that that causes a woman um, as she becomes mature and uh, deals with the traumas from childhood. So I, I, and I, I learned from what she went through, which of course put me through it since we were a, an unbeatable team and I never thought of uh, deserting her, um, was that uh, the people who wouldn't believe her the people who would say, oh, no, uh, your father wouldn't do a thing like that. I mean, it's it's a cliche because it's so often the case. But you run into the, uh, in, I think it didn't John Wayne Gacy have a wife and children. I mean, you you can't let them off the hook just because they don't seem the type 
or because they're a friend of yours or a relative of yours that I learned that and and have no interest in giving an accused molester the benefit of the doubt because I see that happen much too often where it, it is it is unfortunately uh, legitimate and it, it takes so much for the women to come forward because they run into so much skepticism. So I knew better than to say, no, uh, I love his work and uh, he answers my letters and therefore I reject this. I knew to be uh, open to the possibility, even though if you had said, do you think it's true or not? I would have said, probably not. I, it's very hard for me to believe it, but I know better than to say, that's just ridiculous because that's what real victims run into is that's just ridiculous. How can you say that about this person? Justin, remind me what it was that made you interested in the subject and want to investigate on your own. Well, as I mentioned earlier in the show, it was the fact that when this the the anti Woody movement started gearing up, I I not from any specific person, but generally I I felt that society was trying to guilt me about liking his films. And so I, it, I was sort of wrestling with the question that many people do of, do you put the artist separate from the art? But then it's like I told myself, there's, well, there's a threshold question here. Is he actually guilty of what they are claiming? And then I thought, like, what, you know, I, I knew in a vague sense, wasn't this sort of gone through in the early 90s and nothing came of that what then right. why and so it really started it inspired me to really get into the thick of the evidence that was already known back in the early 90s and the more and more i went through it it's like this isn't a he said she said situation that that the press wants to pretend it is these days this was there was a literal i mean not a literal but it, there was a mountain of evidence right that all actively confirmed Woody Allen's actual innocence. The, 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 you know, it, it wasn't even just, oh, there's a little bit of, of doubt. It's like, you know, just proof after proof. The expert testimony say, you know, national experts in child abuse saying not just that it was inconclusive. They are saying that in our expert opinion, there was no molestation. And then you get into the eyewitness account by Moses Farrell, who was in the house the whole day, who could account for their whereabouts the whole time. The eyewitness account by Dylan's nanny, who admitted that for her, she only lost track of them for 20 minutes. So you'd have to believe that the one and only time that he has been accused of molesting somebody would have been in a house full of people in the middle of the day when he knows Mia Farrow could come back at any moment from shopping, right. suddenly in a 20-minute window, dragged her up to the attic, touched her and, in a And he's claustrophobic. Yeah, exactly. And, and then when you look at the timeline yeah. between when this happened and when the Soon Yi affair was was discovered, and, and that the fact that Mia Farrell still insisted on working with him on Manhattan Murder Mystery as an actress after he accused him of child molestation. Just, you know, the, the just witness after witness and timeline, and it just all, the, the, the Dory Previn song lyrics, which, you know, we can get into what that refers to and means in, later on in the show. It's just everything pointed to his actual act of innocence. And I, you know. But well, sadly, yeah. Justin, it wasn't he said, she said when it happened, but it has morphed into that because Dylan has now grown up and can speak for herself. So now you have her, you had that, she did an op-ed thing saying, why has me too spared my father who raped me? Why are all these other men being held accountable? Why, do, why is Hollywood permitting him to be let off the hook by this? And then she went on, I don't know, CBS or something and had tears streaming down her yep. face. And that was a whole lot of people's first introduction to this whole controversy. 
like I said, you know, something that happened in 92, or I should say didn't happen in 92, this is already pushing 20 years ago. And so... Well, 30, almost 30. 30 years. Yeah. See, yeah. see how quickly. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and they're not willing to look beyond just scrolling through their, you know, the, the news feed and going, oh, well, I guess this is what happened. Well, another, mm-hmm. another thing is the level of, of horrific dysfunction in the Farrow family going back to, to John Farrow and Marino Sullivan, um, the alcoholism, the infidelity, the spousal abuse, and then with with Mia and her brood, um, the suicides. Um, her brother is in prison for, of all things, child molestation. John yeah, Farrow Jr. in a court of law. Yes. And what? Another. I mean, we haven't even gotten into all of the misunderstandings understandings about who Sun Yi was and is and, and their relationship, but they have two now teenage daughters that they adopted, but they adopted them when they were very, very young. What adoption department would ever authorize Woody to adopt two young girls if there was any cloud hanging over him? Well, this is, there's so much of this uh, that Justin's kind of set me straight on. And over the years, we've talked about this, the common misperceptions that Soon Yi was Woody's daughter. She wasn't. That, well, that Mia Farrow was married to Woody Allen. They weren't. That they lived together. They didn't. I mean, there's this whole litany of, of yeah. sort of accepted uh, fabrications about their relationship. Right. That, that she, was un- she was under age and mentally deficient so he was like taking this retarded girl and messing with her it's like just he's just a monster of, of all, you know beyond all proportion but he never spent the night at Mia's he never see the, the Woody's ability to compartmentalize which uh, is gotten into in in Bob Whitey's great documentary about about Woody Allen, he really is able to put things in boxes and say, this is that, this is that, and they don't slosh together. And his, the thing about his compartmentalizing is that, uh, you know, he, he's able to think if Mia were right for a part, I would still cast her. It wouldn't occur to me to do this out of spite um, there's so much it, it, just because of the way he is. And, and again, people are always projecting, well, like he, 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 I wouldn't do that if I were him. And it's like, yeah, that's the, that's the, the huge if is if you were him, you would have done it this way or wouldn't have done it this way. But, uh, you aren't. And he, he follows his own path. I also am, astonished at his ability to continue being creative through all of this because i i feel like if i i ran into something like this where i was falsely vilified and couldn't get films done in america and all that stuff i would just be hopping mad and wanting to stop people on the street and say let me explain to you why you're wrong about me and instead, he has just accepted that a certain portion of the world will think he's a monster, uh, and he's never going to dissuade them from that. And yet, you know, it, it's like if it were a rock in the middle of a stream, I would stand there shaking my fist saying, God damn rock, that rock there is preventing all. And he would just go, oh, all right, there's a rock. Then I'll go around it this way or this way. I'll write a play. I'll write my memoir. I'll film in Spain. I'll... And it's like it really doesn't, you know, it really yeah, it doesn't defeat anything. him. Yeah, and is that is that a positive characteristic or a negative characteristic? Because I almost respect. Yes. yes, it's both. You're saying, <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I I just know that, and I know everyone says this. If I were accused of some horrific act like child molestation, I would I would go on every interview show I could to clear my name. I wouldn't let that rest. 
and it it always does seem like it's uh, guilt by uh, uh, not guilt by association, but guilt by non refutation. By not refuting it, you're sort of giving it energy. Well, he refuted it to some degree, and of course, I mean, back then, and what it was met with was, well, of course, he's going to say that. Mm-hmm. So if you come out and say, I didn't do it, people say, well, of course, he's going to say he didn't do it. And if you don't say something, it's like he didn't even have the guts to face it. So it must be true. So he, he really can't win if people are are of a mind to believe the worst. And and it, when you start running through all of the Sun Yi things, um, they just they end up. You know, when you start disputing, you know, she wasn't even his adopted daughter. He never acted in a, a parental role. You know, that's that compartmentalizing thing. He felt like, and he was right, Andre Previn was Soon Yi's adoptive father. He's the one that had the parental role. He and Mia, Woody did not make decisions, was not in any kind of parental role, and as I say, didn't even spend the night at Mia's. So all the people that leap to the conclusion that, well, if he wasn't his, if she wasn't his daughter, she's his adopted daughter. Well, if she wasn't his adopted daughter, the dynamics were such that it's a father-daughter kind of relationship. Therefore, it's incest. So when you had the, the, the Dylan thing, um, even if you can convince people to give them the benefit of the doubt on that, they say, well, I st- he's still icky because of that whole Sun Yi thing, and I'm never going to watch one of his movies again. That sums it up. Yep. yep. So uh, one of the things that uh, Woody Allen writes about in his book that uh, obviously Ronan Farrow was groomed by Mia Farrow to despise him. He alleges that uh, Mia Farrow had Ronan undergo cosmetic surgery to add a few inches to his height, which required the breaking and rebreaking of his legs. He called this yes. barbarism. Uh, yes. Is that true? I've never heard that. Yes. Yes. Uh, she, she had his legs surgically broken twice to give him an extra inch or so because she was concerned that he would be short and mistreated for his shortness and she thought he might have a political career it wasn't when he was a little kid it wasn't when he was a, a toddler or anything it was when he was older and he still submitted to it i also didn't know until i read the book that uh ronan continued to sleep with mia and mia was naked at least until he was 11 yeah. And Which Mark, is, you know, if you want to talk about, oh, well, let's get judgmental about someone. All right, then let's not be judgmental. But I do find it interesting, to say the least, that she was sleeping with her son, literally sleeping, in the nude into his adolescence. Well, people defend Mia Farrow uh, by saying that she adopted children that no one else wanted, that they were, you know, kids that were... Uh, abused or had uh, mental or physical problems that that were made them difficult to adopt. Can we at least give Mia Farrow the credit for having done that, adopting kids that no one else wanted? Uh, no, because she treated the non-white adoptees as slaves. She beat them. She deprived them of food. She locked them in the closet. She would hit them forcibly if they um, contradicted her. Uh, She spoiled the white ones and and terribly abused the brown ones. So if someone if someone adopts if someone rescues dogs from the pound and then tortures them, do you give them credit for sparing them having been euthanized at the pound? Justin, what were you going to say? I was going to say, that's why two of them committed suicide, and uh, a third became a drug addict, and through the drug addiction, ended up dying of AIDS on Christmas Day. Right. Well, why do you think Ronan, I mean, we can't get into someone's personal psychology, but why, why Ronan, who's successful and famous on his own, 
Uh, and I think a tremendously talented guy. He's very bright. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you know. He inherited his father's intellect well, what, and his mother's original face. Let, let's, t- <laughs> let's talk about who his, who his father actually is. Uh, people for years have believed that Ronan Farrow was, in, fra- in fact, Frank Sinatra's child. And uh, uh, Frank Sina- I'm sorry, uh, Woody Allen addresses this in his book. He says, despite her, meaning uh, Mia Farrow, yeah. suggesting Satchel was Frank Sinatra's child, I think he's mine, though I'll never really know. Uh, pretty easy to find out if someone is, in fact, someone's father. Why yes. has there never been a DNA test? Do either of you know? I don't know. No, either do I. I, I, I. My suspicion is that, regardless of what the truth is, uh, I, I think Ronan wants to, for marketing purposes or what have you, you know, distance himself enough from his father, uh, and latch on to the Frank Sinatra mystique, if you will. Well, also it. It's another way that Mia has robbed him of stuff. I mean, she has succeeded in what I call Arbuckling Woody. You know, Fatty Arbuckle was falsely accused of rape and acquitted, but his his career was destroyed by people who refused to believe he was innocent. She she did the you you took my daughter, now I'm going to take yours, and the next day was the announcement of the alleged molestation. So what else does he have? Well, uh, Ronan is Woody's only blood kin child. They adopted uh, Dylan together, but Ronan was his natural child. So by spreading the Sinatra thing, it helps to rob him. I'm, it's like I took your daughter, and now I'm going to take your son and say it wasn't even you. And You're not even the father. Uh, Steve, when you say they adopted together, they, they did not admittedly adopt at the same time. Mia had adopted Dylan first. Right. Then Ronan became a single-parent co-adoptee uh, a couple of years later. No, not Ronan. Or I'm sorry. Um, Woody. No. Woody. Dylan. Dylan, yes. All these Irish names. <laughs> yeah. Mia, Mia wiped the slate clean of Satchel yeah. and... Uh, uh. So, um, uh, do you think we'll ever know the truth about this? I mean, it does seem like... Yes. Uh, I know you you and uh, Justin and Steve, you both are very convinced and and you think the jury is not still out on this question about whether or not Dylan was molested by Woody Allen. Um, and, and there does seem to be enough to indicate that that's probably not what happened. I think, Justin, you outlined it. Uh, do, do you think we will ever actually have an admission by Mia Farrow? Dylan, pro- as you said, probably believes it. She's been brainwashed or she's had a implanted memory of, of uh, uh, an event that didn't occur. Right. Uh, the, bigger quest- the bigger question is... Will will Ronan ever crack? Because he is extremely bright, mm. and I suspect he knows the score. But either out of allegiance or fear of Mia's wrath, or just the idea that you know we're in this so far, you know the Vietnam thing. It's like, well, we've been in it for this many years; we can't just stop now. I think in order to be supportive of Dylan and the trauma she's gone through again, because of what Mia did, not because of what Woody did. Um, he feels like he needs to throw in with the, I believe my sister people, but I really wonder what he really believes and if he will ever budge from that. I don't see Mia ever budging from it. But I do wonder about Ronan because I bet he knows it's bullshit. And also he he has been bullying. He He's the one who's been behind going to the managers and agents of actors and actresses that work with Woody and basically blackmailing them into saying, unless your client renounces having worked with Woody, we're going to label him as someone who excuses or enables a, a predator. 
Um, Justin, you walk me through this because uh, you have some background information that might explain how the whole story of the molestation taking place in an attic crawl space or uh, walk me through that, Justin. Yeah, it's uh, one of the many aspects of evidence that points to Woody Allen's innocence uh, uh, is the fact of song lyrics written by songwriter Dory Previn uh, that's called With My Daddy in the Attic. Well, who's, who's, who's Dory Previn? Dory Previn was the wife and eventually ex-wife of Andre Previn. And the way this worked was that it, it's tough to keep all the names together <laughs> in your head here, but uh, Andre Previn, famous uh, songwriter, composer, uh, was married to Dory Previn until Andre Previn had an affair with Mia Farrow, who became pregnant uh, through Andre Previn and uh, basically stole Dory Previn's husband from her. Wait, who is who is the offspring of... I didn't realize there was a kid that is the product of the marriage. Uh, I don't, was Mia Farrow married to Andre Previn? Yes. And, yes. Who, After, and, who, and who is their kid? Uh, they had twins, I believe. Um, Steve... I, you know, I can't keep them. Straight. Hold on one Drave moment. A I can, uh, if you give me a moment, because I, I wrote an essay detailing all of this, but I can't keep it straight. Uh, I mm-hmm. thought I thought Mia Farrow's only biological child was Ronan. That's not correct. No. Okay, there's others. Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay, all right. Uh, others from Andre, not from Sinatra. Or Woody. No, Woody's is... Ronan. That's the only one. I know that, but I'm saying, other than Ronan, there are no biological children. Yeah, between Mia Farrow right. and Matthew Previn and Sasha Previn, both born 1970, both twins. Okay, and where are they? Uh, they are around. I don't. In terms of what, I, if if I'm trying, if I recall correctly, I think one might have worked for IBM. Uh, let's see here. We need to we need to get ancestry uh, ancestry dot com on the line. <laughs> uh, Matthew Previn, a partner in uh, it's a law firm, Buckley LLP's New York office, specializes in the representation of banks and financial institutions. Okay. Sasha, was he the IBM guy? Let me see. Here. And who ra- who raised the twins? Mia. Mia and Andre. Okay, but. Uh, but their marriage wasn't that long lived, right? They only were married for a few years. Uh, well, but then they still they adopted Soon Yi, right? Uh, and I think another or two. Again, there's so many. But you know, Andre continued to be their father, as with any divorce where there's children involved. That he doesn't stop being the father. Um, yeah, no, no. They, they they were married for a good number of years. So during the what I term the Andre Previn era, yeah, yeah, they uh, they had two biological children, Matthew and Sasha, both born in nineteen seventy. Then uh, they adopted Lark Previn in uh, nineteen seventy three. Uh, oh, then they had a I'm sorry, a third biological child, Fletcher Previn, born nineteen seventy four. Uh, and then in 1976, they adopted Summer Previn, who later became known as Daisy Previn. Jeez. And uh, then finally in 1978, uh, both Andre and Mia adopted Soon Yi Previn. So if we count all the kids that called Mia Farrow mom, it's like... 11, 15, I mean, how, how, do you... Do you uh, hang on a second, I've totaled that. Uh, there'll be 14. Wow. Holy. Mia Farrow has adopted 14 children, four of which were biological. That includes Ronan. Uh, yes. And how many are dead? A uh, number of children who have died in either tragic or mysterious circumstances, three. Yeah. Uh, number, but the two others who are alienated from her and no longer speaking that would be Moses and Sunni. Right. And and Moses is a psychiatrist, right? He's a medical doctor. 
Yes. Um, I know he's a family therapist. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think he's a psychiatrist, not a psychologist. He's a psychiatrist, which means he I'm has not a... sure about that. Okay. I'm not sure either. And, and he he is uh, defended Woody Allen, but they are they are also estranged, right? He is not Woody is not close. No, to... no, Woody oh. Woody and Moses are uh, have a wonderful relationship, and <laughs> Moses felt bad because he was pulled into the. Uh, stick up for mom or suffer the consequences way back in the 90s. And he joined in denouncing Woody uh, because he was basically pressured into it and felt bad about having done that. But, you know, for all that he's been through, Woody doesn't tend to hold grudges. He's very understanding. And now he and Moses have a wonderful relationship and um, he's not even against, you know, if if uh, Ronan said, I would like to meet with Woody, uh, Woody would not have the, no, no, the iron door is closed. I refuse to. He would be fine with that. Um, so, uh, oh God, there's so many children in that word. <laughs> that's crazy. I got a fly. That's why, that's why I had to write an essay cataloging them all to keep them straight in my mind or yeah. go through and and, and w- when you get into all of the name changes on top of that because me insisted on changing their names sometimes yeah. years after they and, and Moses is older than Dylan or Ronan and is in a much better position to have first hand memories of what did and didn't occur at that period exactly so well, you were telling the story, Justin, of how this whole, what you believe or many people believe was the origins of the molestation in the attic story. So so we're back yeah. to Andre Previn is uh, Dylan, is uh, uh, Soon Yi's adopted father. Correct. And so, go on. Uh, so was originally... Married to a, another songwriter by the name of Dory Previn before Andre had the affair with Mia Farrow, and Mia Farrow essentially stole Dory Previn's husband from her, which caused Dory Previn to go into uh, have a mental uh, meltdown where she was committed and underwent electroshock therapy because of this. But after she came out of uh, the institution, uh, she wrote an album which included a number of songs. Uh, and this would have been in 1973, I believe. So this is years before Mia Farrow even met Woody Allen or knew him. And one of the songs was Beware of Young Girls because, I mean, it was directed at Mia for having stolen her husband out from under her. Exactly, which Mia Farrow has acknowledged in court that she understood she was familiar with the song and knew that it referenced her. But even more interestingly, on that same album, Dory Previn wrote a song called With My Daddy in the Attic. And the lyrics to the song tell the story of a father who has an incestuous relationship with his daughter in an attic. And not only is it any father... But the father is specifically described as a clarinet playing father, which is very interesting and quite a coincidence because next to his filmmaking and stand up comedy, the thing that Woody Allen is most known for in life, in his public persona, is playing the clarinet. Why did Dory write this song? Did it have anything to do with Woody Allen or is this is just no. a coincidence? She wrote it in 1973. Okay. Seven years before Woody Allen even met what me. A weird, but what a weird bunch of coincidence right right you would think yeah okay all right that's odd okay (laughs) and so you have a you have the song let's and before you play it tell me the lyrics i should be listening for oh let's see here it's uh one second i don't have the lyrics in front of me but i so but you can certainly hear that uh and who's singing who's performing the song story prevent Okay, this is Dory Previn, years before the molestation accusations, writing a song uh, about a father who, a clarinet playing father who molests his daughter in an attic. Okay, weird, but all right, let's hear it. 
All right. Hang on a second here. I'm firing this up. It might go something like this. Long intro. Dark attraction lies with his madness on the nightstand placed beside his loaded gun in the terrifying nearness of his eyes with no window spying neighbors and no husbands in the future to intrude upon our. Cross the stand. Here comes the clarinet part. Where we live on peanut butter, spread across the salted crackers, and he'll play his clarinet when I despair. With my daddy in the attic, with my daddy in the attic, with my daddy in the attic, past the stand. Where we live on peanut butter. Spread across the salty crackers And he'll play his clarinet When I despair So right. it, it goes that down is, with a similar refrain but That is a very weird song if I've ever heard I one. can't understand why it didn't knock <laughs> Elton John and Led Zeppelin off the charts <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very catchy uh, What was Andre Previn's relationship with Woody Allen? Um, I think what? they had a pretty good. Re- here, here's an anecdote that I don't think has ever been uh, discussed before. It's actually kind of charming, uh, which I think is welcome at this point. Um, uh, there was a a put it together swing set for the children at Mia Farrow's house in Connecticut. And Woody and Andre were both trying to figure out, they were both trying to follow the, you know, Ikea type directions. And it was working out horribly. Neither of them could figure out what goes into what and connects to this. And of all people, Stephen Sondheim walked by and Andre Previn said, oh, good, there's Stephen. Maybe he can help us. And Woody said, what does he know? He's a lyricist. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine driving past seeing Woody Allen and Andre Previn and Stephen Sondheim and Mia Farrow all saying, well, let me see those a second. No, no, you were supposed to put the other bar over this thing. Anyway. Yeah, now they, they had a, a, a before the two Mia Farrow was discovered, they had a cordial relationship. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Steve Stolier, what was Groucho Marx and Woody Allen's relationship? I have a feeling you have some keen insights into that. Well, uh, Groucho took a very early interest in Woody in it when Woody was starting out in stand up, and he turned a lot of his uh, peers on to Woody Allen. Um, because you know, Groucho was from 1890 and and was uh of that era of vaudeville and, and early standup and the Burns and Allen and Bob Hope and all that. But he loved whatever, if something was funny, it didn't matter if they were from some young whippersnapper or something. So he took an early interest in Woody's career and they would correspond. And, uh, 
uh, he would what he would get advice about his his material and delivery and um do you know if they ever and, met oh yeah sure and i mean and and woody was at the um at the carnegie hall show that dick cavett hosted in 72 and um woody said when he met groucho it was a little disappointing because he felt like he was just sort of like a funny uncle that someone might have. He wasn't as crazy about meeting his heroes as Cavett was. Cavett sort of made an avocation of it, and Woody wasn't one to lionize people and get all gooey and trembly at the thought of meeting someone. But he loved Groucho and had enormous admiration and respect for his comic mind and uh, Groucho was a sort of a, took an avuncular interest in helping Woody along and then became a big fan and would see all of his movies as they would come out. I know you're uh, asking you to summarize this is a little unfair because you wrote a whole book about it, Raised Eyebrows. But uh, how did you find Groucho to be? Did he meet it, meeting your here one of your heroes and, and living with him basically for several years? Well, uh uh, oh, let me see how I can do this in a compressed way. I, f- I first saw Groucho from the back of the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in 72 when he was doing his one-man show, and I hadn't realized how old and hazy he had gotten because the press was still selling the idea that good old Groucho at 80-something, just as sharp as ever. Mm-hmm. And so it was kind of a sledgehammer blow to the solar plexus when he shuffled out to the podium and started reading slowly off of three by five cards. And I thought, Oh gee, the Groucho that I wanted to meet is gone. But then when I met him, I met him, I started a committee at UCLA to, to put pressure on universal to re-release animal crackers and got in touch with Aaron Fleming, the woman in charge of Groucho's life. And she brought Groucho to UCLA I said, Groucho, I'm very happy to be meeting you after all these years. And he said, well, you should be. <laughs> and uh, Aaron said, this is Steve Stolyer. He's trying to get Animal Crackers re-released. And Groucho said, did you get it? And I said, not yet, but I'm working on it. And he said, you better or I'll fire you. <laughs> and I said, I didn't realize I was working for you. How much are you paying me? And he said, a little less than nothing. <laughs> and I thought, I don't believe this. And what I got to realize was when I, and this is, actually getting finally getting around to your question it is getting to know him in the comfort of his home at the lunch table without 10,000 people and spotlights on him i realized how much was still there of the old groucho not the old groucho and and he i mean it was still a compulsion for him to twist lines into puns and i mean he made me laugh many times And uh, it was just an extraordinary experience getting to know him that intimately and be able to just chat about vaudeville. And I mean, his firsthand memories went from before the Wright brothers to after the moon landing. So he was this this time capsule. Uh, So there was nothing disappointing about it at all. What was his worst uh, personality trait? What was what? What was his worst personality trait? His worst personality trait. Well, you know, time had actually had actually made him a, kind of a kindler, gentler Groucho. But there was still the the guy who would snap. And uh, luckily, in the in the three years I worked there, there were only a couple of times when I felt reprimanded, and it was just a terrible feeling because you don't want your hero to be upset with you for something. So he could live up to his. You know, he wasn't named Cordulo. I mean, there's a reason why his name was Groucho. Um, but for the most part, you know, uh, it, it was pretty wonderful, except getting close to my hero as he was fading out and having to put up with the mercurial personality of Aaron Fleming. But most of it was remarkable. So I've had really good luck meeting my heroes. Cavett and I became friends and he hired me to write for him in New York. And I had always been wary of asking about meeting Woody Allen, who was one of 
Cabot's closest friends, because especially after I saw Stardust Memories, I thought, gee, he seems to have such contempt for fans, and what would I ever have to say that would remotely interest this intellectual? And Cabot, when I was living in New York, Cabot called me up one day, and he said, say, Stolier, I noticed that Woody is shooting his <laughs> new film around the corner. <clears throat> and I thought you could come over to my place and we could just happen upon it and then you could meet him. And I said, oh, and he won't mind? And Cabot said, I didn't say that. <laughs> he may very well say, really, Dicky, I wish you hadn't. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's great. I'm nervous about me meeting him to begin with. And now you're saying, no, there's no guarantee he won't be upset that you're here. Um, but we went over and it was a building that, uh, uh, that was a sequence of medical offices. And uh, this sounds like I'm exaggerating it for the purposes of drama, but uh, I stood at one end of the hall and there was a long hallway. And at the end of it, there was an open door with a bright light coming out of it because that's where Woody was shooting them. But it had such a Wizard of Oz feel to it. And Cabot said, stay here. Let me check this out. So I watched him stand outside in the hallway watching them shoot. And then the light went out and Woody Allen and Mia Farrow came out of the room hmm. and, uh, they were talking, and I thought, wow, it's Dick Cabot and Woody Allen and Mia Farrow. And then I saw Cabot point to me, and the two others looked at me, and I did the me looking behind me <laughs> thing. And, then I, and, and uh, so I approached them, and Woody Allen said, uh, uh, I'm Woody Allen, and this is Miss Farrow, and we're here on the set of our latest motion picture. <laughs> Like it was Entertainment Tonight or something. And it was a movie called Hannah and Her Sisters. And yeah. it was the scene where they, uh, it's a flashback where they're at a doctor's office and learn they can't have children. So I, I'll always know that was the day that I met him. But Cavett had, had told him about me. So he knew who I was. Um, after Groucho died in 77, I thought, well, now there's no reason for Cabot to stay in touch with me because I was a pipeline into Groucho's house. And now that that's severed, why would he want to fool with me? And instead, he, it would, uh, Cabot called me from New York and said, listen, I hope just because Groucho's gone, we're not going to lose touch. And by the way, I hope you don't mind, but I've shown some of your letters to Woody. And he says, these are very well written. So I had to empty the urine out of my shoes. <laughs> and out. So he knew that I was that guy that worked for Grouch. Mm -hmm. show, but I was still concerned. But it was a very comfortable conversation, and there weren't any real revelations mm -hmm. there. He he did mention that when he was doing Zelig, he wrote Greta Garbo to see if she would be. He said he said I knew that she was retired, but I thought she might be interested in doing this, being one of the on-camera people interviewed about Zelig for mm -hmm. the faux documentary. He said, you know, I, I told her she could have complete control over the clip, and uh, if she wasn't happy with it, we wouldn't use it, and it could be as long as it wa she wanted and wherever she wanted all this. And I never heard back from her. And Cabot said, did you send it to 123 East 49th Street? Mm -hmm. He said, yes. And I said, you probably put the wrong apartment number on it. <laughs> and Woody went, that's probably what it was. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you want Greta Garbo in 4D. You wrote 4E. We had no idea which Greta Garbo you meant. Anyway, a lighthearted moment in the yeah. midst of all of this stuff. Steve, so last question uh, about Woody Allen and Groucho Marx. If you were to pinpoint one thing that you think is the apex of their careers for both – Groucho Marx and Woody Allen, obviously, separately. What would you say is the one thing you should watch for each of them? Oh, my. Picking snowflakes out of a blizzard, are we? <laughs> well, I guess for Groucho, I'm awfully partial to duck soup mm -hmm. in terms of the Marx brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, for... For Woody, well, I mean, there are the early funny movies. There, It's so hard to pick what someone would respond to. I mean, I still think Take the Money and Run are bananas, and bananas are hysterical. The early stuff, but then yeah. you get into more mature stuff like Annie Hall and Manhattan. Mm -hmm. But then there's wonderful things later on, like Crimes and Misdemeanors and Hannah and her sisters 
it's really hard to just recommend one match point. And it sort of, it yeah. depends who I would be recommending it to. Uh huh. Justin, same question to you. Uh, uh, not about Groucho Marx, but about Woody Allen. What would you say is the apex of his uh, career? Uh, I, I mean, he's he's done. I think at least fifty five films. So, but if I if I were to pick out a few, I'd go Annie Hall, Manhattan. I think Zelig remains the best of the the Mia Farrow era, although Purple Rose of Cairo was a close second. Um, and I also like the earlier funny ones too. F- from his early career, I well, you had to pick uh, one though. You had to pick one. Oh, <laughs> one out of a fifty-five. I'd still go Annie Hall. Yeah, Annie it's, Hall. it's <laughs> common. It's the common choice, but I think yeah. it's the correct one. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I I really appreciate both of you being on. Steve Stolier, uh, you can check out his IMDb and uh, see all the things that he's worked on. And uh, hopefully you will one day soon see his uh, Groucho Marx book, Raised Eyebrows, as a... uh, As a... As a movie. As a movie, yeah, a motion picture. And uh, Justin Levine, I'm sure we'll have you on again soon. We'll, We'll reunite. Sounds good. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much, Steve. Nice meeting you. And uh, Likewise, I'm sure. <laughs> I'll be back next Tuesday, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. Thursday night, it's uh, Lucido and Looney in for me for the Thursday night show. Seriously? Say again? Seriously? Yeah. No, Th- thanks for checking with the site there, Justin. Thanks for being on top of things. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and uh, use our Amazon and eBay links when you shop Amazon and eBay. Helps support the fine programming here at talkradio1.com. You can also make a one time or monthly contribution using our PayPal link. All of that is available to you on the talkradio1.com homepage. Also, you can leave a message for us uh, for the show using the phone number on the top right of the screen. You can call that anytime, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Back next Tuesday, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. Till then, why don't you do everything I wouldn't do right here on 